You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. What's going on, Foundry Church? As we get going today, one of the things I want to look at and, and kind of leap from is, is out of two, one literary character and one cinematic character. If you like literature, which I don't know if we have any literature fans in the room, but um, but I became a voracious reader uh, I think primarily because my Aunt Bonnie, uh, she was an English teacher. She always talked about um, literature and different things and reading, and, and it seemed like she enjoyed it so much that once I really gave it a crack, I loved it, and I love reading, and I love, I love the way someone can develop a character. You fall in love with them, and then you know, they either you know, kill them off or something. You're like, what? You know, Seriously, when Katniss's little sister... I'm still not okay with little, I'm still a little bitter about that one, but that's not what we're talking about today. Getting back on topic, I like that that took officially like half a minute to be on a rabbit trail, Um, but it's just how it goes. Um, But today, really two characters, That, that character Boo Radley from To Kill a Mockingbird, I love the character of Boo Radley. He's this scary kind of um, hidden away character. And, and he's, he's not known by the community except by the rumors and the ideas of who they think he is. But they don't actually know Boo. And the other character is um, Old Man Marley. Does anybody know what movie that's from? Yes, Home Alone. It's from Home Alone. Old Man Marley is the guy in the big kind of like... Um, Oh, I'm going to say gumboots. That'd be very British. But like they're like snow boot kind of things. And he's dragging a trash can full of salt and his shovel down the sidewalk. Yeah. And the and um and I think uh Butch or whatever the name of Kevin's older brother is, is like telling him how he uses the salt to dissolve the bodies. Which if you're a kid in church just went, Whoa, what? Sorry, you can talk to your mom and dad about it. But um it's this it's these characters that are kind of shrouded in mystery. They seem unnerving. And both people, both of these characters, Boo Radley and Old Man Marley, were assumed to be scary, mysterious, and somewhat an enemy of normal, healthy society. And what I love about this is that both of them were actually living under false identities. They didn't assume themselves. They had been put on them, and they were lies told by other people. And in the end of both of these I mean, eventually, To Kill a Mockingbird was made into a movie which was amazing. Gregory Peck, the best Atticus Finch ever. But um, but they were made into movies, but both these characters at the end of it turn out to be the ones who save the people in need. Uh, Boo Radley saves Jem, and um, Old Man Marley saves little Kevin. And we see them in a totally different light, not on their reputation as told by maybe cultural myth or, or kind of this, I think we have a love in our culture of mystifying people and then creating bad narratives about them. It's just, it's the society of trolls, right? We have this trolling nature. And, and people look at them a certain way, but then their actions disprove what we thought of their characters before. Today, we see that. We're going to see that. But I want to ask you a question. Has the enemy, Satan, sold you a lie or maybe told you a false narrative of who God really is? Has the enemy told you a false narrative on who God really is? I think the enemy delights in deceiving us to think of God like old man Marley or Boo Radley. This hidden, opaque figure who is malevolent in some way, dangerous and scary, and when you do see him, you don't want to make eye contact. I wonder, has the enemy sold you a false narrative on who God really is? And why do we believe it? I think Luke chapter 13 helps us understand that. In Luke chapter 13, we dive into, well, the reality of who God is. He actually shows us. Luke does such a good job in lining up these stories of Jesus' life and ministry to show us part of the heart of God. 
And we're going to live in the tension between Saturdays here, okay? So we realize that what happens in chapter 13 probably wasn't mashed up really tight chronologically. It's the way the stories came together. But I do want to maybe answer the question of why we're so quick to see God as a Boo Radley or an old man Marley. Here's what it says. Uh, Luke 13, chapter or verse 10. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit, so a demon, for 18 years. She was bent over, could not straighten up, and when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and began praising God. If that happens in any church service... I guarantee the church would be like, whoa, and be kind of blown away. And probably worship would ensue. But here's how the reaction that Jesus got. Indignant because Jesus had just healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on one of those, not the Sabbath. There's your narrative. There's, there's the, the before the good action, old man Marley. I think religious people are often cold, heartless, and held to rules that they use to, quite honestly, smack us back into line, right? Even when a good and godly thing happens, the religious paint a picture of God that is not God. And Jesus, being completely anti-religion, tells a different story between Saturdays, between one Saturday to the next, we see the Sabbath, we see Jesus at work. And um, we understand that between Saturdays, what we're working through in chapter 13, it was not probably as chronologically tight in Scripture between Saturdays like it was for us in devotions these past week. But The bookends to this passage are healings on the Sabbath. And what I would like to do is just take a quick look at the framework, build the framework of how Jesus invites us to think about God and the heart of God as revealed and displayed by Jesus. Not as told by myth and legend, but as living revelation through the person of Jesus. We're going to look at God through the lens of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the healing of the woman on the Sabbath. Then we have this wonderful story of the mustard seed and faith, which I think is fascinating because a mustard seed is so, so incredibly tiny. So incredibly tiny. And Jesus says, if you have faith that small, it can still grow this great big tree, bush, that birds live in. We had it this year when a a bush by our house, all the leaves fell off and we found inside the bush this big tree nest, or big bird nest, tree nest, um, big bird nest. And it was like, it was perfectly like, it was like what I thought a tree or a bird nest in a tree looked like. It was perfect, but it was totally hidden in this bush. And it made me think of the mustard seed parable that Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, tiny little faith, you can still grow and give life to the world around you. And Jesus is reminding us that it's not up to us. Our faith in him moves mountains. Our faith in him, it's who our faith is in that changes things. Then he talks about the kingdom of God being like yeast in dough. Uh, Isn't it funny? He goes back to this in a positive light. Yeast in dough, a little bit will change and increase it a lot. It'll increase it. Again, our faith in him increases the the kingdom around us. Then he talks about the narrow road, which I think quite often we look at the narrow road and we see it through a negative light, a religious hostile light, and we'll talk more about that. Then Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. He weeps over Jerusalem. And I'll tell you, it's always interesting when you're trying to decide what to preach on in a chapter like 13. You know, which one of these do you pick out and and kind of hold up for public display and public discussion and discernment? Which one do we really look at? But what God showed us this week as as studying and leaning in and questioning how we should attack this was um, 
the way his heart is revealed in this chapter, but not only in the tender stories of the healing on the Sabbath and the invitation to have small faith. If you have small faith, he'll do great things. It's not just his heart in those things. It's actually, I think it's really found, uh, we see the heart of God in a few words that are spoken by Jesus when he's standing over apart from the city of Jerusalem. You have to remember it's Flatlanders who live in Michigan, unless you're you know, one of the out west listeners here. Um, but as Flatlanders, it's hard for us to see. You, know, you don't understand getting up on elevation and seeing a long ways, unless you go climb Mount Pisgah, which it's almost time where we can do that. What up? Um, I'm so happy to go outdoors again. Um, but But when you go up and you get at elevation, you can see, and Jesus was probably standing on like the Mount of Olives, and he's looking across the valley at the city of Jerusalem, which is on a hill. And he would have been looking at it, you know, kind of like uh, apart from it, and he would have been able to see it in its entirety, not sprawling out, but just Jerusalem, the city on a hill. He would have been able to see that. And he's standing there, and when he's standing there looking at the city, These are his words. He turns and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, and I tell you, you will not see me again. Until you see, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I love this text. I love this text because it's a like father, like son moment in scripture. It has this amazing kind of link to it. And I love the way this text speaks and reminds us that Jesus is a reflection, a full reflection of God the Father. But in the terms of Jesus Christ, like father, like son, Jesus is the fullest reflection, the fullest extension of the heavenly father. And Jesus makes a claim about his likeness to God. And we need to understand this because when we talk about Jesus being like father, like son, we have to understand the heart of God is being revealed in what he said over Jerusalem. I want to, I want to share this with you. John 17, 20 to 23 says this. This is part of the high priestly prayer. Jesus at the Last Supper is praying over the disciples, over the future church, and different things. So Jesus is praying, and these are his words. I do not pray for these alone, speaking of the disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, that the church that the apostles start may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe in you and that you sent me and the glory which you gave me, I am giving to them and I have given to them, that they may be, may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I love that text. Jesus is saying, I and the Father are one. There is, there is a oneness of God in this, a full reflection of who God the Father is in the person of Jesus Christ. And sometimes people get the misconstrued idea that the God of the Old Testament is mean, old man, Marley-ish, and he's out to smite, kill, destroy, and push the red button right? And just destroy things. But Jesus is nice. And I think we need to dispel that myth and look at the tender-hearted view of God that he gives us and Jesus reaffirms. There's actually a psalm, it's one of the more well-known psalms, that speaks the very same language Jesus spoke over Jerusalem. It's Psalm 91 and it says this, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, right? 
in the shadow of the Almighty. When you're kind of in the shadow of something, you're un- you feel like you're underneath it. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, he is my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Do you remember what he said, what Jesus said about Jerusalem? How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers its chicks under its wings. So this like father, like son moment shows us that the God of the Old Testament wasn't mean and cruel. The God of the Old Testament is being fully reflected in the work of Jesus Christ and his salvation work in redeeming us out of religious hypocrisy and cruelty. So when we look at Jesus and know that he is the fullest reflection of the Father and we understand that there is this weird kind of, I think, analogy of God being like a mother hen, like a mother hen. And what kind of protection does God offer? What kind of protection does God offer in, in painting himself into this mold of being like a mother hen? I love this imagery because I think it's a self-sacrificing image. It's the image of a God who um, opens wide the invitation and offers to gather, you, gather everyone who, to what? To the law? To church? No, to himself. See, he's saying, come to me. It's like the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come and brood under me. Get under me. Let me protect you. There is um, a story of this of a, of a mother hen that died in a fire. And the story is, it's a bit of an ur- urban legend. It's it, There's no, it didn't happen. But here's the reality. It paints a perfect picture. And I think it holds for the image of God because in terms of Christ, it did happen. There was, um, the story goes that a, a state firefighter, so one of the wild firefighters, uh, for the wilderness fire squads and stuff out west was walking through a charred part of the forest and he saw a carcass of a mother hen and he pushed the carcass with his stick and when it rolled over, a brood of little chicks ran out. And what the image was, was that during the fire, she covered her chicks and at the expense of her own life, saved them. That holds up for us, right? At the expense of his own life, Christ saved us. So we look at this and we realize, okay, maybe there's a tenderness to God we don't get. Maybe there's something we've missed in the tenderness of God. Why does Jesus say that there's a narrow door? Why does he say that? It seems so exclusive and and hard. But actually, I don't think he's being mean. I think in the reality of it, he's not making it difficult. He's letting us choose and he's making it very clear. There's not a lot of ways into salvation. There is a narrow door. But his love invites us to choose the one option that is clearly truth. His love is amazing, gracious, and it longs to protect and gather us to himself, but he will not force it. I love the imagery of a hen for one real clear reason. A hen doesn't have hands. It can only open itself up to welcome you in. It can't forcibly gather, right? I mean, in cartoons, you'll see a chicken playing poker. But really, in the end, that's not going to happen. Because a hen can only gather, can open up, and then when they come, gather into themselves and keep safe there. But they can't force and pull, right? Have you ever gotten in trouble in a store when you were little and your mom walked out and you were being drugged by your arm? Anybody else have that happen? Right, it happened to me. I thought that was what you did when you went shopping. Um, So I thought that's how you left stores until I was like 14. Um, (laughs) I learned late. It happened. But uh, the reality is that, that the hen opens up to let the chicks come and brood. And they're incredibly feisty and vicious when their brood is 
um, is under threat. It's interesting because little chicks will run and gather under a different hen, and certain hens will go out and fight a threat. They'll run at predators. There's a story that happened in France this past week of a fox who got into a hen house, which always spells certain disaster for said chicken, right? And it got into a hen house, and they found the fox in the morning dead. I think that's pretty fascinating to me because the door automatically closed, and the fox had to be like, oh, my gosh, I'm locked in Golden Corral, right? <laughs> and, and thinking it's great. But I wonder what it was like when the fox looked up at the chickens and they were just looking back like, well, this isn't going to end well. We're going to give our all to oppose you. And in the morning, the farmer found, or the kids, it was actually at a school, found in the corner a fox dead by a thousand chicken pecks, which I think is terrifying that that can happen. But that's just me. But I love the imagery that the, the chicks will go and sit under another hen and other hens will go out and protect. It's the heart of God that says, I will bring you, I will gather you into myself. You can't save yourself. Let me gather you in. But you have to choose it. And you don't just choose it once. You choose it every time there's danger. We run to God. So here's how I want you to apply it in your life. Since God wants our trust, he doesn't just want our fealty, our obedience, and our submission. He wants us to trust him and joyfully follow like a child walking through Disney with their parents and enjoying being in this place with them. God wants our trust. He wants to be our shelter, our rampart, and our fortress. But if, it, if our shelter and our rampart and our fortress is in God, we have to stop trusting other things that imitate God. We have to stop trusting other things that are not God. So let me ask you this, and this is the question for the day. What are the things you trust in that imitate God? What are you running to get shelter? What are you running under to get shelter that isn't God? And for some of us, it may be religion. We may find ourselves um, satisfied with knowing more about God and um, knowing him up here, even though we have no connection in our heart and soul and no submission to his love and grace and we'll never run to him, we run to a book of religion and we don't run to the living God. For some of us, it may be our gifts and talents. We may think those things define us. So I'm gonna use my gifts and my talents and I'm gonna hide in those to somehow prove that I'm worthy, that I'm able, that I'm special. The only thing that makes you and I special is that we're made in the image of God and he chose us back when we sinned. That's it. Your gifts and talents are really for the glory of God. And if they're about you, they could be one of the things you take shelter under that are very temporary and not stable. It could be money. It could be security. It could be a political party being in power, being out of power. I don't know. I just know this. We have a number of things that we run to that are not God. And when we think of God, I want to push away the idea of a grumpy old God carrying a bucket of salt across the you know street scaring us. I want you to think of a God who like that hen at great personal sacrifice opened himself up and said, come to me, all you who are weary. Come to me. You wonder what God's like? You've got the best picture ever. I want to close with this little quote from the scripture uh, we read. Listen to the opening words of Jesus in this Jerusalem section. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone to death those who are sent to you. That is an indictment. That is an indictment unless these words follow it. How often I have longed to gather your children together. Think of it. He just described brutal murder. But in the end, really, He's saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who have killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how long I have wanted to gather you close. He's not here to just constantly remind you of your sin. He's here to redeem you from it. I invite you, quit running for shelter in that which does not keep you safe or satisfy your soul. Pray with me. God, thank you for your word and for the way you live it out in us. Thank you that you love us enough to open wide your arms and bring us in. As we run to you, you welcome us. 
and we are kept safe under your feathers, under your wings. We are protected by you. So we ask, come Lord Jesus and give us the confidence and the security and the identity that helps us live reminded that we belong to you who bought us at great personal price with your own blood for your glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.